Your brother Ernest, he arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense, I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. However badly he may have behaved to you in the past, he's still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we'd been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I don't know what it all means. I think this is perfectly absurd. Good heavens! Brother John, I have come down from town to tell you that I am very sorry for all the trouble I have given you and that I intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you're not going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think he's coming down here disgracefully. He knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. There is some good in everyone. Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid and leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. He's been telling you about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Bunbury? Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It's enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Of course, I admit that the faults were all on my side, but I must say, I think Brother John's coldness to me peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it is the first time I have come here. Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. We must not be premature in our judgments. I feel very happy. I beg your pardon, sir. There is an elderly gentleman wishes to see you. He has just come in a cab from the station. To see me? Yes, sir. Parker and Gribsby, solicitors. I don't know anything about them. Who are they? Ah, uh, you'd better show him in, Merriman. Oh, very good, sir. Parker and Gribsby. I wonder who they can be. I expect Ernest they've come about some business for your friend, Bunbury. Perhaps Bunbury wants to make his will and wishes you to be executor. I hope, Ernest, you have no outstanding accounts of any kind. I haven't any debts at all, dear Jack, thanks to your generosity. Uh, Mr. Gribsby. Mr. Ernest Worthing. This is Mr. Ernest Worthing. Mr. Ernest Worthing. Yes. Of B4 the Albany. Uh, yes, that is my address. I am very sorry, sir, but we have a writ of attachment against you for 20 days at the suit of the Savoy Hotel Company Limited for £762, 14 shillings and twopence. Against me? Yes, sir. Oh, what perfect nonsense! I never dined at the Savoy at my own expense. I always dine at Willis's. It is far more expensive. I don't owe a penny to the Savoy. The summons is marked on the writ as having been served on you personally at the Albany on May the 27th. Judgment was given in default against you on June the 5th. Since then, we have written to you no less than 15 times without receiving any reply. In the interests of our clients, we had no option but to obtain an order for the committal of your person. Committal? Oh, what on earth do you mean by committal? I haven't the smallest intention of going away. I'm staying here for a week. I'm staying with my brother. If you imagine that I'm going up to town the moment I arrive, you are extremely mistaken. I am merely a solicitor myself. I do not employ personal violence of any kind. The officer of the court, whose function it is to seize the person of the debtor, is waiting in the fly outside. He has considerable experience in these matters. That is why we always employ him. But no doubt you will prefer to pay the bill. Pay it? How on earth am I going to do that? You don't suppose I've got any money? How perfectly silly you are. No gentleman ever has any money. My experience is that it is usually relations who pay. Jack, you really must settle this bill. Kindly allow me to see the particular items, Mr. Gripsby. Seven hundred and sixty-two pounds, fourteen shillings and tuppence since last October. I am bound to say I never saw such reckless extravagance in all my life. Seven hundred and sixty-two pounds for eating. We are far away from Wordsworth's plain living and high thinking. And now, dear doctor, do you consider that I am in any way called upon to pay this monstrous account for my brother? I am bound to say I do not think This so. proposed incarceration could be most salutary. I am quite of your opinion. My dear fellow, how ridiculous you are. You know perfectly well that this bill is really yours. My yes, you know it is. Mr. Worthing, if this is a jest, it is out of place. It is gross effrontery. Never mind what he says. This is the way he always goes on. You mean now to say you are not Ernest Worthing, residing at B4 the Albany. I wonder, as you're at it, you don't deny being my brother at all. Why don't you? Well, 
I'm not going to do that, my dear fellow. It would be absurd. Of course I'm your brother. And that is why you should pay this bill for me. Time presses. We have to be at Holloway not later than four o'clock. Otherwise, it is difficult to obtain admission. The rules are very strict. Holloway? It is at Holloway that detentions of this character take place always. Will you kindly come now, sir, if it will not be inconvenient to you? Jack! Pray be firm, Mr. Worthing. I'm quite firm, and I don't know what weakness or deception of any kind is. Uncle Jack, I think you have a little money of mine, haven't you? Let me pay this bill. I wouldn't like your own brother to be in prison. Oh, I couldn't possibly let you pay it, Cecily. It would be absurd. Then you will, won't you? Of course, I'm quite disappointed with him. You won't speak to him again, Cecily, will you? Certainly not. Unless, of course, he speaks to me first. It would be very rude not to answer him. Mr. Gribsby? Yes, sir? I shall pay this bill for my brother. And it is the last bill I shall ever pay for him, too. How much is it? £762.14 and tuppence. Ah, the cab will be five and nine pence extra, hired for the convenience of the client. Of course. Payable to I must say I find this generosity yes, quite foolish. The heart has its wisdom as well as the head, Miss Prism. Thank you. Good day. Good day. Good day, sir. I hope I shall have the pleasure of meeting you again. I sincerely hope not. Quite so. Right. I think we might leave the brothers together. Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. You young scoundrel, Algie, you must get out of this place as soon as possible. I don't allow any bun ring here. I have put Mr. Ernest Things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Uh, Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. <laughs> what a fearful liar you are, Jack. I haven't been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. Your duty as a gentleman called you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. What earth did you go up and change? It's perfectly childish to be in deep mourning for a man who's actually staying for a whole week with you in your own house as a guest. I call it grotesque. You are certainly not staying with me for the whole week as a guest or anything else. You have got to leave by the 4-5 train. Well, I certainly won't leave you so long as you are in mourning. It would be most unfriendly. If I were in mourning, you would stay with me, I suppose. I should think it most unkind if you didn't. Will you go if I change my clothes? Yes. If you don't take too long. I never saw anyone take so long to dress and with such little result. Well, at any rate, that is better than always being overdressed, as you are. If I am occasionally a little overdressed, I make up for it by being always immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct an outrage and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However... You have got to catch the 4-5, and I hope you will have a pleasant journey back to town. This bun ring, as you call it, hasn't been a great success for you. I think it has been a great success. I am in love with Cecily, and that is everything. I promised Uncle Jack that I wouldn't speak to you again unless you asked me a question of some kind. Cecily, mayn't I stay to tea? I wonder you can look me in the face after your conduct. I love looking you in the face. But why did you try to put your horrid bill on poor Uncle Jack? I think that was inexcusable of you. Where's Uncle Jack gone? He's gone to order the dog cart for me. He's going to send me away. Then we have got to part. I'm afraid so. It's a very painful parting. It is always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity. But even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. Thank you. Uh, the dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. I hope I shall not offend you, Cecily, if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you will allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it, may I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. 